Now, believe me when I tell you, I didn't want to have to do this video. But so many videos about the tariffs I've seen are just either A, just blatant self-promotion, or completely flat out wrong. So, I decided I've got to do it. Now, understand two things. I'm not political, and I don't have any interest in the political aspects of this. I'm a small business owner, and I'm a 3D printer, so that is my interest here. So if you have a small 3D printing business, and you want to see how you might proceed with the tariffs in place, you found the right video. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, I spent the last 10 years dealing with Chinese manufacturers, U.S. distributors, and an array of supply chain issues. So even though it wasn't directly in 3D printing, obviously it applies either way. Now I'm definitely open to input from you guys, so definitely jump in the comments and let me know what you're doing to deal with these tariffs. And if you have any questions, obviously jump down in the comments and let me know. If I'm wrong here anywhere, let me know in the comments. I did my best to make sure that things were clear and accurate, but I'm subject to error just like everyone else. Now I've got some notes and I'm going to be referring to these notes, so bear with me moving forward because I, no one could memorize all this, to be completely honest. So to look up the government HS codes on specific tax tariff rates applied to specific products. And 3D printing is obviously our interest here. So we hear 145% tariff, and we think that's going to apply to our 3D printers and the products we use, when in fact, that's not really true. The majority of the 145% tariff only applies to products like toys and textiles and some select electronics, but 3D printing does not fall under that. And understand that I am not truly versed on this code, so this is just me looking up these codes and confirming with multiple sources to make sure I'm correct. So HS8485 is what 3D printers would fall under, and that would be 35%. Now we will get a little bit deeper and we'll discuss why you probably won't be paying that 35%, except for in rare cases. The other one we need to be concerned with is filament, and that falls under HS3916. Now that specific one is actually at 50% tariff. The other one is parts for our 3D printers and that's HS8477 and that falls in at 35%. Now again, I've done my homework and I believe I have the right codes and under sections like parts, it's a little vague, but most things under 8477 are 35%. So even if I don't have the exact code, most of the things under that HS code fall at 35%. So let's talk a little bit about these percentages and how they might impact you and how you'll be able to minimize that impact to your small 3D print business. Again, already a bit of a relief because the 145% doesn't apply to us and we're all like, whew, because obviously that could have a major impact. Now, if you want to check these numbers for yourself, this is hts.usitc.gov. And you can look up any of those codes you would like just to confirm for yourself. These are my findings, and obviously I'm no expert in tariffs, and they are subject to some error, I suppose. But I've done everything I could to make sure that they were accurate. Now, I will add this is on top of the typical 3 to 5% that is already applied to any product coming in the United States. So you'll just need to be aware of that. If you say 35% and then you try to do the math, you won't quite work out on some prices. And that's because you're probably not accounting for the three to 5%, which is usually about three and a half percent that applies. And then the 35% on top of that for 3D printers. And one other thing I'd like to bring up is the de minimis. Now, that means that a product coming into the United States from China, as long as it costs less than $800, is not subject to tariffs anyway. 
and that will be in place until May 2nd. So technically, any Chinese manufacturer that's charging you the tariff right now doesn't actually have to. Now, how can you or your Chinese manufacturers that you deal with mitigate this tariff when it comes to applying it to products you buy? Well, one of the easiest things for them to do is to set up U.S. distribution where they can sell their products at wholesale to a U.S. distribution and then turn around and sell that product to you. Understand the tariff is applied when the, the product is caused to come into the United States. So if it comes into the United States at a wholesale price, then the tariff will be applied to that wholesale price, not the actual retail price that the product sold to you. Now, unfortunately, I don't think Amazon FBA is going to avoid that. So they would actually have to set up an actual U.S. distribution center here in the United States. Now, some companies already have that, like Bamboo. They have one in California and one in New Jersey. And depending on what they sell the product to their U.S. distribution for, we may see some variance on that tariff. So it may be substantially lower depending on what they sell the product to U.S. distribution for. Now, customs, obviously, if they say, hey, this printer has a $339 price and we're selling it to our distribution in the United States for a dollar, customs is going to have an issue with that. So they're going to have to strike a balance with how much they can discount the price to their U.S. distribution to mitigate that tariff, but then turn around and sell it to you here in the United States. Now, why would the United States tolerate that behavior? Well, because it creates U.S. jobs and U.S. taxes are paid, obviously. When that product is sold here in the U.S. from that distribution center, then income taxes can be taken. And employees that live here in the United States work there to distribute those products and their paid salaries, and then obviously they pay income tax on that. So that makes a lot of sense to do that and the government to allow that because it kind of fixes part of that problem, right? It creates U.S. jobs versus shipping that product directly to you from China. Now for you as a small business owner, how might you mitigate these tariffs? Again, buying from a Chinese manufacturer that has U.S. distribution is a smart move. That's going to reduce the amount of tariff that's applied to those products. The other option is to buy from U.S. manufacturers. Now, some U.S. manufacturers still buy their components from China, and that's something we'll have to look out for. If you can find a U.S. manufacturer that their components are also U.S. manufactured, then that tariff could be mitigated completely. That's one thing I'm really looking into is U.S. manufactured hardware and also U.S. manufactured filament. Now, I may have to pay a premium for the machines with the tariff because at the end of the day, they're still cheaper than some of these U.S. 3D printers. But I haven't reached out to any of the U.S. manufacturers that make 3D printers yet to see the kind of products they make and even if they'd be interested in sending me one to review. But what I do know is that filament, there's definitely some savings there. And I have reached out to a couple companies to see if they would send me samples just to see if we can review their product and see if it would work for us. Obviously, paying for a U.S. made filament is not subject to tariff. And then, well, that at the very least will create some consistency with the pricing. Now I'm in a good position and this is probably too little too late for a lot of you, but something you may wanna implement later. One thing I learned from dealing with Chinese distribution is that sometimes the supply chain breaks, sometimes you can't get your products. They may be on New Year's, it's hard to tell, but sometimes you'll have to fall on US distribution to get your products. So what I've always done is did a worst case scenario for my pricing. In this case with 3D printing, when I set my pricing up, it's always at two cents per gram or $20 per kilogram. So even if I have to buy that filament at full retail price at $20 per kilogram, I've got myself covered because that's what I've been pricing it at all along. Now this kind of goes the same ways for 3D printers. Basically I do 3D printer price spread out over 1500 hours to cover that price 
And then that is what I apply for machine time for my 3D prints. So typically I use $500 as a nice round number. $500 at 1,500 hours is 33 cents per hour. So that's what I charge for machine time. Now, if I buy a printer cheaper, so for instance, when I bought the A1, the A1 was $339, which means I just ROI even faster on that machine. But by my pricing structure, I can pay up to $500 for a printer and I'm still all right. So these fluctuations, as you can see, when you saw the A1 go from $339 to $499, I'm still okay because I've been pricing at that level all along. This is something you probably should be doing is kind of future-proofing your pricing. Don't assume just because you buy it for X now that it'll always be available for that price. Now, unfortunately, this comes down to what you produce. How is it that I get away with charging that much? Well, the reason is, is because I'm in a niche market. I'm in a market where, well, basically no one else is producing the parts that I produce. And because of that, I can charge whatever I want for the part because I'm the only one making it. You may be in a different position. You may be up against larger manufacturers that have hundreds of 3D printers and they're making thousands of little wiggly bits every day and multicolored dragons and clicky turtles and all that stuff. And you're trying to compete with those guys. And unfortunately, that's going to be tough for you because they base their profits off of volume, which means they can make tons of products and sell them cheap. And that puts you in a bad position. So now you're dependent on buying your 3D filament cheap and your machines cheap. And if those prices go up, that affects your bottom line. Now, if I was in that position, I would be in a holding pattern because I can't buy 3D printers cheap right now, I probably wouldn't be buying any. Or I would be looking on the used market, trying to find value, trying to find that printer for that price I need to buy it at. Understand if you pay more for a printer than you originally priced for, it's gonna take you longer to ROI and you're going to have to charge your customers more. And if you're in a high pressure market where there are many people producing those parts. You raising your prices might take you right out of the market. Well, I hope this information helped you and I hope it helps you devise a plan. Obviously, if you have questions, you can hit me up in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And again, I'm open up to any input. So if for some reason you think these numbers are off or you look up and you find a different code, please let me know in the comments. Again, we're just trying to get everyone together to have a conversation about what we're going to do moving forward with our small 3D print businesses. So I'm always open to your input and I appreciate it. All right, guys. Well, that's it for now. If I get a bunch of questions, we may do a follow up video. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and tap that little bell so you can get notifications when I upload my next video. All right, guys. Later.